Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome to this very special edition of Atlanta Business Radio. We are broadcasting live down here at the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute at Georgia State. Lee, I love doing this at the – seems like we're doing it kind of monthly, but I, I wish we did it every week, man. This is so much fun. I know, a lot of activity here. This is going to be a fantastic day right out of the box. Please join me in welcoming to the broadcast here in our first episode with Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Invest Atlanta – Miss Noel London, how are you? I'm good. Good morning. Thanks for having us. Well, Noel, uh, we're here to talk about Invest Atlanta's program. Um, what is it? Students to Startups? Yes, that's it. So tell us a little bit uh, about it. Uh, how's it work? Perfect. So um, thanks for having us again. Um, my name is Noelle London. I'm with Invest Atlanta. Um, I lead our innovation and entrepreneurship efforts. Um, at Invest Atlanta, we're the economic development authority for the city of Atlanta. Um, we do a lot of different things, anything from attracting companies to move to our great city um, to supporting affordable housing financing. Um, we have economic development and community development under one roof, which is fairly unique for a city agency. Um, and I sit on our economic development team and lead our innovation and entrepreneurship efforts. So um, we have developed a toolkit of resources around access to funding customers and tech talent for our local startups. That way, those startups that are growing in our city and scaling feel supported by the city of Atlanta and want to stay here and continue to grow. Um, but then also, we're working with companies that may be interested in moving to Atlanta, establishing a presence. Um, and we're really that local partner on the ground that helps them to do that. So now when you're giving this p pitch to a company that's not in Atlanta, what are some of the the benefits that you highlight? Yeah, well, there's a lot, sometimes too many to name. Um, but what we are finding when we're talking to startups that are moving to the city of Atlanta, um, they're really interested in um, the access to corporate customers, um, especially for those B2B companies. We have the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 companies, over 30 corporate innovation centers. Um, so that access to customers piece is really important. Um, also, with having the world's busiest airport, Hartsfield-Jackson, um, the ability to get here here. You can go to New York for a business meeting, be back with your family by dinner time. That sort of a thing. That's pretty. Um, that's pretty attractive to growing companies um, to really maintain that work-life balance. And also, I would say access to wonderful talent. Um, students like um, Shalish at Georgia State, who you'll hear from momentarily. Um, you know, the access to talent. We've got seven different universities in the city of Atlanta, all with really wonderful value propositions and and really strong students. So that's, I think, what we're what we're hearing the most. Um, yeah, I would think that uh, cost of living and the diversity of the economy is yes. also yes. Kind of so so yes, uh, absolutely. Um, the diversity of the economy. I mean, especially with those tech startups, um, we don't just have. This isn't a one industry town. We don't just have one industry. So the ability to test and validate across a number of different industries, I think, is really attractive to the startup community. Um, on the ta on the talent piece, um, I would also say, I mean, the diversity of our tech talent. That is a piece of that as well. That's that's really interesting interesting to a number of companies that are moving to town. Now, is Invest Atlanta's role is to kind of woo them or is it to once they get here, then you kind of help them get the lay of the land? We do it all. <laughs> so we do it all. So um, not only is it helping um, companies to learn about Atlanta and learn about what the wonderful assets to building a company here. Um, so we do that. We do the attraction piece. But then once those companies are here, it's not a checkbox where they move to Atlanta and, and we and quit working with them. They'll see you later. No, 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 no. <laughs> we continue to work with them and make sure that they're successful. So if that is, hey, an announcement goes out and we support them um, with the initial office setup. And then later on, they're attracting talent and realizing, hey, we don't have connections into Georgia State. Well, that's a great opportunity for us to um, make sure that they know about the wonderful talent that's here. And then that's where the students to startups program kind of comes into play where you're kind of a matchmaker and helping the startup find young uh, talent yeah. to help kind of groom them maybe to be future employees but at least to help 
serve them to help them grow? Yeah. So um, about two years ago, um, when we were talking to startups about, you know, what are your key challenges to building your company here in Atlanta? Talent continues to come up. It's not only with our startup community, but when we're, you know, working with larger companies in Atlanta, talent continues to be one of the number one things that we're asked about. I don't think that that's super unique to Atlanta. I think that that's right, a challenge that's everywhere. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to think about how do we help to address this gap within the ecosystem um, on the on the talent side, I mean, with startup companies, they're growing quickly. They may need, sh- they may have short term needs. Um, they may not always have the time to really vet and, and source that talent. Um, and then on the student side, um, you know, it's hard to learn about entrepreneurship in a classroom. You really need to go to a startup company and know what it's like. Um, and then also we've got great talent and, and we need to make sure that our talent knows about our growing startup ecosystem. Um, there's not just startup jobs on the West Coast. We've got some really great companies in town and we want to make sure that those students feel connected into the ecosystem um, and know about those opportunities. Um, so we launched this program in partnership with WorkSource Atlanta and Startup Atlanta two years ago. Um, two years ago, we did a pilot program. Um, and with this program, what we do is just like you said, we facilitate the connections. We want to make sure that startups know about the tech talent pipeline in Atlanta. Um, so what we've done is uh, we pair students, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds into local Atlanta based companies. We pair them up. We run the application process, and then we pay those students to go and work for our growing tech companies. Um, so we pay them, um, and then we do some trainings throughout the course of the program. So, um, for example, a few weeks ago, I'm not sure how long ago that was, Shalish, but we did a uh, maybe – three weeks ago or so, um, we did a coding boot camp with the students at Flatiron School, one of our newest boot camps, um, coding boot camps here in Atlanta. So, um, you know, from the program and and from the first year, we saw um, out of the students, three land full-time positions out of the program and continue working for their startup companies. And then uh, I think around 64% of those students continued working with the startup companies beyond the course of the program. So, um, you know, it's it's been one where we're excited about it. We're constantly learning and improving, but, um, you know, we're, we're really glad to have this and have this resource for our local startup community. But isn't it kind of a chicken and egg thing? Like, which comes first? Do you have to have a pool of students that are willing to to go somewhere or like what's harder for you to get the students or get the startups to raise their hand and go, you know what, I'm in, I'd love to get some, especially if you're paying, I mean, yeah, well, you'd yeah. think that they'd be lining up for this kind of program. Yeah. And, and what I will say, I, the pipeline is not the challenge. The pipe, uh, the challenge is more the curation of the program and the program management. So, you know, we had, um, in our first, yeah, this year, I think we had around 250 applications. So the challenge so is that's not the stu- applications or students, both students and startups. And st- so it's a two part application. It's right. a really competitive program. So we have, um, startup supply as well as the students. Um, we first, choose the startups and um, we want to choose those startups based on are you scaling in the city um can you commit to mentorship of this student? What's the work plan that you are putting together for the student throughout the course of the program? Um, and what are the deliverables that that student's going to own while they're a part of that program? Um, so we first and choose. And what's the length of time of commitment? So it's a 12 month, uh, excuse me, 12 week internship program. Um, and those students are working 35 hours a week. Mm-hmm. So it's like a full time ish mm-hmm. job. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, and it's no cost to the startup. So the startup, um, what we find in, in these kinds of programs is it's really helpful for that startup to also be invested in the student and be invested in the program. So we pay two thirds of the cost. Mm-hmm. The startup pays one third of the cost. So we pay for most of it. Mm-hmm. And then so how many uh, startups get selected or got selected for the last one? For this year, we have 20 startups that are a part of the program. And then how many applied? Um, of the applicants, oh, off the top of my head, I would say around 65 or 70. Okay. So like one out of three, one out of four get admitted into the Mm -hmm. program. And then the rest of the 250 war students. Yes. And they were coming from the seven universities. Mm -hmm. Yes. So all city of Atlanta students. Uh And then, um, for them, do they, what's their criteria to make it in? Sure. So, you know, every startup has their own, um, 
you know, criteria for looking at those students. And so the students apply. Um, we help with whittling down that student pipeline based on what are the skill sets that the startup's looking for? Is the startup looking for any particular background? Uh, and then we send along a shortened pipeline, but ultimately that startup makes the decision on who they want to work with for the summer. There are all sorts of things to take into consideration, culture fit, um, you know, personalities, um, backgrounds, skill sets. So um, we try and make it as easy as possible for that startup, but they ultimately make the decision on the student. And then is it exclusively tech or is it uh, like, what are the kind of talents that the students need to have? Is it like you mentioned coding? Is that a must have or is it like, you know, I can be a creative or a marketing or a writer or something yeah, like that? I think that's a really great question. Um, because the thing is, is at a startup and even at a tech startup, there are so many different roles in building a company. It's not just somebody that has those technical skills. Um, it's it's more of a DNA. It's more of a mindset sometimes to be successful in a startup. That creativity, that adaptability, that determination and perseverance. Um, so really, we are looking at the student pipeline and, and there are a number of different roles. Um, we've had um, students that are psychology majors and do really well at these companies. It's not just, um, there are a lot of different, uh, I think, mindsets, a lot of different backgrounds and experiences that can help you to be successful. So marketing roles, business ops roles, um, you know, business development, finance, tech, we see all of it in this program. Now, when the student comes in, is there any coaching from your side that helps them kind of, maybe they're, you know, they check a lot of the boxes, but they don't have, maybe they're not as good in coachability, or maybe, you know, they need some tweaking in some of the areas. Is there any opportunities for mentorship from your side to help them pre prepare themselves for kind of an entrepreneurial role as opposed to I'm a cog in the machine and like a big company where yeah. I just have to be trained and I do these six tasks, whereas a startup is more chaotic. And sometimes you are going to be asked to do something that may be out of your comfort zone. Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, so our role is to be the facilitator. So we we connect the dots where we can between the students and the startups. And again, we really look closely at those startups on are they able to commit to the mentorship of this student? Um, throughout the course of the program, though, we continue to offer opportunities to connect in with additional resources. So, for example, um, we had a really fun onboarding session, um, you know, with some startup trivia and connecting into, say, Startup Atlanta, if you want to learn more about um, some of the different resources that exist locally, um, some of the different, you know, tech blogs that you can read to stay up to date. Um, so we continue to kind of facilitate into additional resources. We also do have lunch and learn sessions throughout the course of the program. So, um, through those lunch and learn sessions, the students have been able to connect in with some of our entrepreneurial communities and learn about how they're supporting their startups. Um, the students have had the opportunity to, again, learn coding or at least just the beginning parts of, right. of learning coding. So um, we try and connect them to opportunities. And then, um, you know, we still are in touch with a number of the students that were a part of last year's program and just continuing to make sure that they feel supported as they're navigating um, job opportunities with our startup ecosystem. Now, what has been your experience in kind of interacting with young people? Are you finding that more and more of them are kind of leaning into this entrepreneurial lifestyle, which is more of a lifestyle than I think, you know, kind of a career path maybe, then, um, you know, maybe historically there's been a lot of people like, I'm going to be an investment banker. I'm going to, you know, go down a more traditional job path. Yeah. I, I mean, in terms of the interactions that we've had with the students, I think there's a lot of curiosity right now about entrepreneurship. Um, it's it's an alternative career path. I, I would call it a career path, but um, it's an alternative career path. And I think that it's wonderful that students are getting in front of these opportunities and these experiences while they're in college. A lot of times we hear from entrepreneurs that we work with, hey, I was in my mid thirties and I had been at corporate for 10 years and right. then decided I wanted to go and start my own thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's, you know, there's no right way and wrong way to go about this. But if there are students that are interested in entrepreneurship, this is a part of their DNA. They're, they want to pursue this. Um, we want to give them those experiences earlier so that they can hone those entrepreneurial skill sets earlier if that's something that they want to pursue. And do you think that 
that's kind of becoming just kind of an accepted path now that that's part of it. Like to have an entrepreneurial mindset is going to help you no matter what career path you choose, right? Like it's just a different way of looking at things instead of being a cog in the machine, you are kind of an owner, whether, you know, you have that owner mentality, no matter what your job is. And right. you, you can look at your boss as your client. That's also a way to yeah. look at things, no matter what kind of path you decide to ultimately. Yeah. And I mean, I would, one example from um, our first years in the program is we did have a student who, um, you know, she did really well at her startup, but at the end I was asking her, you know, what do you think is next? You know, what are there ways that we can be helpful to you of kind of getting you to the next place? And she said, you know what, this whole startup thing is not for me. And right. to us, that's a success. That's, exactly. That's good. Because if she, you know, thank goodness that, um, you know, she learned that through the course of the program and right. she wanted to go into a more traditional consulting path. And that's great too. And we're not saying that this is the right or the wrong way, but it's a these, way. It's right. a way. And this is an alternative career path that sometimes students aren't being supported by. Um, and so we want to make sure that um, they have the opportunity and, and can make that decision on whether this is the right thing for them. Now, in the programs in Invest Atlanta, do they start at college and beyond? Or is there some things you're doing to kind of create this uh, entrepreneurship mentality in the younger age? Yeah, that's a great question. So this um, this particular program is our program focused on youth for innovation and entrepreneurship. So um, we are starting with college age and, and beyond. But I would say, you know, if there are students that are interested earlier on um, in this career path, there are some great organizations around town. We're not doing it all. We're not trying to do it all. But there's some great organizations around town that are doing an excellent job of this. Um, Technology Association of Georgia has a great education program where they're pairing um, K through 12 interns into um, oftentimes startups. So that's a great program. Um, the Young Entrepreneurs Program is also wonderful. Um, so Year Up is another program that's great. Um, Perscolis is doing excellent work. So um, we're not the only ones doing it and we're not trying to be. There's some great groups in town that are helping us with exposing our future tech talent pipeline um, to these kinds of opportunities. But part of your role is to be a place where all the information is. Um, we like to think so. I mean, try to. And, and, I yeah, mean it's and always it, growing. Yeah. And, and there's so much. I mean, every week there's a new program popping up in town, which is excellent. Mm -hmm. um, so it can be overwhelming. And if your head's down building your company, knowing right. all of these resources and tips and tricks um, can be time consuming. And so I think as much as possible, um, we're trying to help our startups to help our ta tech talent pipeline um, with just connecting in with some of these resources and, and making sure as much as possible that people know what's going on and in all of the places where they can find some support. So now here with us today, we have a, a couple of people that are involved with the students to startups program. You have a, a, a intern person and you have a, a startup. So why don't you introduce who you brought? Excellent. Um, so today we have um, two of our program participants for this year. I'm so excited to hear from them. We have Diane, who is a part of Competitive Sports Analysis. Um, welcome, Diane. Thanks. Glad to be here. And then we have Shalice. Shalish, who is working with Diane this summer um, on competitive sports analysis and is a current GSU master's student. Um, so really excited to hear from them. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm equally excited to, to be here. All right. Let's start with Diane. Diane Bloodworth uh, with Competitive Sport Sports Analysis. Uh, tell, tell us about what you're up to. What, what's your business? Excellent. Uh, we provide predictive analytics for sports. We predict the fit of a recruit for a college football team. Mm -hmm. So now um, you use just the data of the past history of the recruit? We look at three different data points. We look at their academics. We have a smart. So that, yeah. that comes into play too. It absolutely really? comes into play. Ask ask uh, the Ivy League schools. Uh, they're looking at that pretty closely. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look at the academics. We look at their high school stats. <clears throat> Sorry about that. And then we look at a skills analysis. And we worked with an NFL scout to identify the skills by position. So it's primary football? Primarily football right mm -hmm. now, but basketball is, is in, it's on, on the, the roadmap <laughs> next. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we look at the skills per position and we have done 
looked at 30 years worth of data and found the best predictors of performance from high school to college to the NFL. So we weight those heavier, but the coach can go in and customize it, change what's important to them based on their scheme and style of play or based on how they recruit. So now the baseline information, the data that you capture, how does that, because I would imagine different schemes would require mm-hmm. different things from different athletes in different positions. Exactly. I used, I can no longer use this analogy since uh, Coach Johnson retired, but mm-hmm. in the past, I would say Georgia Tech is looking for different skills in a quarterback than Georgia is right. since they ran the option. So the coach can go in. So arm strength may not have been important for them as it is for a, a team that's going to pass a lot. Right. So they can go in and adjust they just take a slider bar and adjust that and the coaches love that ability because they don't believe that one you know one size doesn't fit all here now um this seems to be such a difficult um group of people to assess because even at the nfl level when they're drafting Mm -hmm. they miss all the time i mean like people it looks good and then when they get to the next level of competition something is amiss That's right. So it's a great opportunity that, you know, we saw that two things. One, you're talking about the effectiveness, but there's also, it's not efficient. The way that these recruits find these coaches and these coaches find these recruits is a very inefficient process. Mm -hmm. So we're working on, on both of those. And at a minimum, we want them to have more data driven discussions. We're not going to solve all those issues that you're talking about. It's not going to be a perfect fit every time, but at least you're starting to look and compare based on these data points. And then like, how do you assess for heart or, or yeah. want to or desire, you know, or how am I going to handle, I think I should start and I'm not going to start and I'm going to sulk on the bench and I'm not going to try anymore. Like, how do you kind of factor that stuff in? Well, we can't measure heart just yet, but I totally agree with you. I think, you know, and, and the one I like is grit because as an entrepreneur, you learn all right. about grit, right? So you can use this yeah. for startups next, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, uh, what we do, what we are looking at is I'm talking to a couple of companies that have um, leadership analysis and character analysis um, for high school uh, student athletes. And we are looking to include that. The coaches also want to know, you know, about their character and are they a culture fit? Mm-hmm. So. So we are going to get to some of those that are a little more subjective, but we're going to try to find some repeatable ways to make those assessments. And is that the biggest challenge is to really kind of define that those kind of characteristics or is it like seeing uh, like how do they know in the high school if the quarterback can throw accurately? Are they capturing that information in a way that can be kind of shared? Well, we capture all their high school stats. The high schools now, most of them report their uh, stats to Max Prep. So we have uh, access to right, but there's accuracy per- in that type but of like thing. But like accuracy, in, I can see they completed 75% of their mm-hmm. passes. But in high school, the person could have been wide open. And in college, the window yep. to throw to is much smaller. It's much smaller, yeah. So then are they really accurate or are they just, you right. know, right. better athletes? Yes. So they can look at, you know, they're going to study a lot of video Mm -hmm. uh, on these athletes and do their own analysis of whether they think that particular athlete can grow and make it to the next level. And some of the skills in the uh, skills analysis are a little bit subjective. I mean, with quarterback, the number one skill is game management and leadership, right? So you're right. There are some challenges there. Everything's not going to be, everything about an athlete is not quantifiable. Right. So, but and to answer your question about the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge is getting coaches to think about doing something in a different way and using analytics and being comfortable. That's different today. That is that really? at the college level, that is the biggest They're challenge. They're still like going for gut feel. And, you know, I, I can tell because I looked at them for a minute. <laughs> well, I think they look, I think, you know, and there's nothing wrong with gut feel, right? Because that, that instinct has been built over maybe 25 years of coaching and recruiting. And so I don't want to uh, downplay the importance of that. But for some of these, uh, especially in the area of recruiting, uh, analytics are new. Now, where we are seeing more analytics is more on the sports science in the uh, training uh and uh, preparing for the game, there's there's a lot of data around that. And that's helped pave the way for us now with the recruiting analytics. There's more openness to it. So they so they are op- they're open to 
to kind of looking at the information, mm-hmm. but they're not yet ready to make decisions based on it? Um, it varies. We have really worked to find coaches who are innovative, and we've also been able to uh, give coaches an opportunity to use this. For example, we were the technology partner for the Georgia Showcase. So all the coaches that came... What's the Georgia Showcase? Georgia Showcase is... Uh, the Melfar Jr. and the National Football Foundation put together this showcase here in Atlanta. It was the first year it was in. It's like a combine? It is a combine. And these were for football players that did not get a D1 offer. So they had 23 schools that are D2, D3, and NAIA came to take a look. How many athletes participated? Uh, I think there was 125 athletes. And Georgia's got tremendous right. talent uh, in football and uh, they used our product scout smart um, mm-hmm. to one we put all the data in there about the athletes and then we put all their 40 time and everything they did at the combine was in there as well and then the coaches could go in and put their own notes and analysis and use it and that made the coaches very comfortable with it once they started using it we've also recently launched a mobile app that's very simple and we actually they tell us what they're looking for in a recruit and we just push those recruits to them and they can save them or delete them. So again, we're trying to make it uh, more integrated into the process and easier for the coaches. So now, um, can you talk a, a little bit about what uh, compelled you to get involved with this students to startups program? Yes, I can. Well, first of all, I've I've used interns in my business partly. Uh, it, initially out of necessity, uh, small budget, uh, interns are great for that, right? They have a lot of ideas and energy and uh, they're low cost. But I saw an announcement about the students to start up program in the Launchpad 2X uh, email newsletter. I was so you're in, part of that? I was in that, uh, that program with uh, Launchpad 2X. And so I thought, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply for this. And I did. And um, I actually ended up with two interns. And then so your needs were data- uh, analytics type needs? I did. We really needed help. Um, my data analyst had moved on uh, to another uh, uh, position. And so I really uh, needed someone who had uh, some experience that could help us do some cleanup of our database. Uh, and we're also working to put junior college, several of our teams that use us want junior college data too. So we need to add that junior college data. And Shalish, uh, I saw his resume and I was really excited because he he is uh, experienced. He had several years of experience. Uh, and I thought, I think, you know, this will be a great find for us. And it has been. He's he's uh, took on a project this summer to clean up some duplicate records and some things in our database that we really wanted to fix that even my developers kind of shied away from. And um, Shalish just, he made it happen. So uh, let's get Shalish on. Shalish, uh, what drew you to Diane's company? Oh. Uh- that's a good question to start with. Uh, hello, Are you everyone. A sports person. You uh, love sports. Yes. So uh, <laughs> the first thing is imagine uh, I, not I, not football. That yes. Exactly. <laughs> so so I come from India where cricket is the so religion. Cricket. So cricket. Yes. If she had a cricket I mean, analytics, you'd be all every day, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's not on the red map yet. <laughs> <laughs> so so that 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 was the first thing that uh, actually you know excited me about her company because uh, see i have no idea about football the only information that i had was when i saw the super bowl which is not very exciting i i only and knew cr- about tom brady right and cricket is nothing like football uh, no no it's it's something like baseball but then again i feel it's more exciting than baseball <laughs> but so now is that diane is that good the person has no football Kind of biases. Is there some not, not, in not that? really. Not really. We normally look for people who have an understanding of football. Um, Shalish had a team around him that knew it, and you know, I I I gave him education on the difference between a wide receiver and a running back. <laughs> Just from a categorization standpoint. Well, he right? needed to know that right. in the database. We need to make sure the stats get to the right, right position. Place, right. right. So now, Shalisha. So now what's your role? Like, what do you, what's your day to day there? Okay. So, uh, as Diane said, I am working with the analytics. So my general, uh, the first thing that I worked on was we had a lot of duplicate data because of, uh, the previous work that we had done. We had somehow got a couple of duplicate data. Uh, it could have been because, uh, one of the, the player might have entered his record and we had one from the admin side. Right. Uh, so uh, that was the, the primary, uh, action was we, so as Diane. Did you want to know that John Smith, is John Smith, right? Correct. Not John A. Smith. 
it, it's it's a challenge. We have over 150,000 athletes in our right. database. So, right. you know, there could be a John, there could be two John Smiths in Georgia. That and are then, wide receivers. That's so, right, or right. wide receivers. So we look at the state, the city, the high school, and the league in order to decide where John Smith is really a and player. And you give them a kind of a unique They have number. a unique player ID. And then once they have that, then they're in the system and then they can be tracked. Because a lot of times yes. they might start as a wide receiver and then they could become a tight end or they can be a different position. That is correct. And uh, one of our the, uh, teams that use us, they ask us to allow the players to have multiple, uh, play multiple uh, positions. Right. So we now can switch positions or have a primary and secondary position. But it's fairly complex. Uh, what we had to do. So Shalish had to come in and learn it. And I know at first he's like, why is this working this way? You know, and then I think once he understood the schema and how we'd set it up, it made sense to him. But it was a pretty big learning curve. Wouldn't you say, Shalish? Yeah. So as she mentioned, uh, because we had very specific requirements. So uh, initially, because I was not very well versed with SQL, the language that we used here, uh, so I was starting with that. Uh, it, it's been probably eight, nine years that, that I did coding in that. So it was a, a big learning curve for me. And based on, you know, every week grilling with her and trying mm-hmm. to understand what exactly the specific requirements were based on that. Uh, in fact, we did it. We completed it last week and we're really happy with the results mm-hmm. we've got. So now, um, from a career standpoint, how were you looking at this? Were you always looking to be involved in startups or what was your career path prior to getting involved in this Uh, program? Prior to this, I have like uh, around 10 years of experience in SAP consulting, but uh, that was, I was not finding my, I was kind of saturated in that. And that's why I took my master's course here, concentrating Mm -hmm. more on analytics, data analytics and data science. And that's when I, uh, I came to know, I threw Lexi, I came to know that's, that's mm-hmm. again a big story. Uh, I met Lexi. We have another program in Georgia State called Panthers in the Valley, where 14 students, uh, every year go to the, the Silicon Valley. Right. And we both are going this year there. And that's how I met Lexi. And Lexi told me about this opportunity. And I, I took it, it the first time I heard it, I took it because, uh, frankly speaking, again, I uh, when you're part of analytics, uh, most of the time that you work is based on, you know, uh, insurance fraud or something like that. That's right. where you majorly uh, work on analytics. And this is something, again, with football, uh, I would never get an op- opportunity here in the U.S. to work with f- football, understand the nuances of it. So the first time that I heard, I just took it. And because I'm really glad. And because even though you've had a career outside of um sports at, at all this was your first kind of foray into the sports world uh yes yes now um has that changed now your career trajectory are you thinking well maybe i'm going to pursue this or is this like hey this was interesting and fun or, and but i'm going to go in a different direction uh i am still discovering it but uh given an opportunity uh now i am well versed what, what i what, what i feel right now is if I'm given an opportunity in a normal enterprise and a sports So this analytics. isn't a normal uh, enterprise. No, no. What I, what I mean is, for example, if I'm given uh, an, an opportunity in like normal analytics and sports analytics, I would any day choose sports analytics. Really? Yes. So what, for sure. what part of the sports makes it more interesting? For uh, you? The, the whole idea of you, you, you working with sports and athletes makes it more interesting, removes if there's an iota of boredom in analytics, it gets removed by with, with sports. Right. So now is it something where you're like, hmm, maybe I can translate this to cricket and I'll go back to India and there's a whole other opportunity there. Uh, in fact, I've already talked to Diane <laughs> about it. Uh, whenever she opens something with cricket, probably I'll, I'll manage that from India. For sure. Right? That seems yeah. like that could... That could make sense in India, may not make sense here in America. For sure, for sure, yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's what the beauty of startups, right? It Where there really is. Opens it, your eyes to something. A lot a of new opportunities market. that you wouldn't even consider. Absolutely. And, and in fact, I've been getting a number of requests internationally uh, from some different Olympic committees in other countries that and soccer clubs in Europe. So I think I have to broaden my scope a little bit. So, so Shalish, maybe it will be on the product roadmap. But you see, that's where, and Noel, you can speak to this. This is the beauty of startups, right? Where there isn't a, hey, we got this figured out and we're just kind of rinse and repeat. Where eyes are open for all kinds of opportunities. And here's a situation that 
could become an international thing where it started out as maybe one idea and it could, it could expand to lots of different places, lots of different, serve lots of different people. Yeah, absolutely. It never gets boring. There's always <laughs> something new to do and different to do. But I think that's also something that's really what we talked about before, just different backgrounds and perspectives and how helpful that can right. be to a the startup diversity, company. Whereas, I mean, right. Shalish talking about cricket in India, you know, initially it was kind of a, maybe a, a joke or an aside, but you know, and you kind start of opening kind of, your eyes right, to the you start kind of spinning it around your head and you're like, well, why not? Yeah. Cause it's like an athlete's an athlete, right? Data is data and they're going to have to pick the right yeah. people. Why wouldn't it work in other sports? Makes your market bigger, right? right? Exactly. Shalisha, I'm curious. Do you now watch football? Uh, Let's not yes. get carried away. Yes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> wow. Not very often, but still, yes. <laughs> But is it interesting to see the data and then you translate it to the human behavior and then you're seeing, okay, I've given them this score, right? I'm sure you use some sort of scoring or ranking, right? A fit score. A fit score. And then you go, okay, that's what an 87 looks like. And then you look at them, oh, now I can visualize what an 87 looks like. Is that part of it? It is. It is. So, and, and there's different scores. So, you know, some schools might be looking more for a higher academic score mm-hmm. to make sure they get into right. the school. Because if so, they can't get in, then it doesn't then matter. Then it doesn't matter if they're a, 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 a high, high score, score right? possible <laughs> in terms of athletic ability. Right. And not only get in, uh, you know, you've Thrive. also got that you exactly, you got to stay in. Right. So, but yes. So now, Diane, what do you need more of in your startup? Um, I think we need to continue to uh, grow our uh, base with the coaches. Mm-hmm. To, to get more education and to get them to accept that this is a valid way and this can work and can be helpful. Yeah, and that's up to us too. We've got to deliver, you know, analytics and, and uh, apps to them that they see that benefit. Um, and we haven't taken any outside funding at this point. So I think to really scale and grow, we'll probably need to do that as well. But I think right now everything's coming together, uh, pretty well. Uh, and, and I had a group of interns and there was, there's four of them that worked day to day together and they're very collaborative and they come to me like, I think this is all coming together. I think we've got something here. Excited. That's and, and, fun, right? and they felt part of it too, which made me, uh, very happy too. Cause I, I invest in them. But I have high expectations that there's going to be a return on investment. Sure. And uh, certainly that was delivered this summer. And then uh, so this program is something that if it was available to continue, you'd definitely continue? Absolutely. I had a great experience with both of my interns through uh, students to startups. And then were you happy how Noelle did? How did she do? She was awesome. She and Lexi are great. They kept me informed. No, you know, sometimes I, you know, when you're in a startup, you don't understand all the rules and, right, you know, rules are, that's, that that's just of, a starting that, point. I mean, rules. really? <laughs> What's that? Right. So they kind of kept us honest, but kept us informed too. Uh, and it, it's a great program. And it was e- they were easy to work with. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then Shalish, for you, um, this was a good experience for you. You definitely continue. This is awesome. I, I, I feel that I, I should be a part of this every time. <laughs> really? Yeah. So it was something that you were kind of surprised and delighted. You, it, it, it over kind of, it over delivered. Yes, 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 definitely. And I would, uh, I would make sure that uh, all of my friends would like juniors make sure that they apply to this program next year for sure. Oh, cause it, it, are you finding your peer group isn't aware of it? Uh, no, not really. Not really? really. Yes, yes. So there's an still. opportunity there. Correct. So, Noel, you must be... For that, oh, thanks for having us on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Noel, you must be over the moon because this is what you want to happen, right? This yeah. is exactly the, the I, outcome you desire. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, we've learned a lot from the last couple of years of this program. I think it's been um, quite valuable for the students as well as the startup companies. Um, and I think, you know, just as Shalish said, uh, you know, any opportunities that we can spread the word, you know, we've had we have this great program. But we really want to make sure that um, you don't want to be the best well kept startups. secret, right? Right. We want to make sure it's a it's a great resource and it's a right. it's a resource that we're providing from the city. So we really want to make sure that um, folks know that these kinds of resources are available and that um, we're investing heavily uh, because we really want to see the startup co- uh, community just grow and thrive. 
Right. Everybody wins. I, I just want to say actions speak louder than words in terms of the benefits of this program. So Shalish finished his eight weeks uh, through uh, Invest Atlanta. He's now in his four weeks, you know, that are supported by competitive sports analysis. But we've already offered and extended him. It's not a full time position, but at least for his last uh, semester in school, a part time dis- position that will go through December. Mm-hmm. So obviously I wouldn't do that if I didn't think his work. Uh, ethic Warranted and his it, right. work exactly exactly so now diane if somebody wanted to get a hold of you maybe one of these teams or colleges or coaches uh what are the coordinates for your organization so they can go to competitive sports um we do a lot on twitter uh out at scout smart underscore good stuff and shalish if somebody wanted to do a pickup cricket game with you uh mm-hmm. Where can I get a hold of you? Uh, you can always <laughs> you can always find me at GSU or uh, I'm available at LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Shalish Kumar Jha. Uh, there, there is where you can find me. You don't have a uh, Twitter, Facebook? Uh, a, uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, for your side not, hustles, I know you got some side hustles going on. I, oh, oh that, that is nice <laughs> to know. Uh, so I am not very active on Twitter, but then I have a Facebook account. Uh, it goes by the name Sunny Shandilit. The reason for that is because I wrote a book and uh, I wrote a science fiction book and that's the name that I used. And most of the people uh, on the websites know me by that name. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much. For and Noel, before we wrap, Invest Atlanta, if somebody wanted to learn more about that and, and the Students to Startups program or the coordinates for that. Absolutely. So all of our programs that are available for startup companies are listed on our website, investatlanta.com. And then you can go through the wizard and learn a little bit more about how we support startups specifically. Um, and then we're also active on um, Twitter as well as Instagram. Um, we do have a newsletter as well if folks just want to stay up to date on everything that Invest Atlanta is doing. And investatlanta.com is a great resource for lots and lots of different things and events and all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. Anything from down payment assistance, if you're buying your first home, to small business lending. Um, So yeah, lots of information there, and it'll give you a sense of just the breadth and depth of the ways that we're involved here in the city of Atlanta. Good stuff. Well, thank you for putting this together. Thanks for having us. All right, this is Lee Cantor for Stone Payton. We will see you all next time on the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Institute radio show here at Georgia State.